back up north to my hometown, Dundee, where the Scottish Labour Party conference is underway. Today's keynote speaker is the Shadow Chancellor, John MacDonald, and he joins us now. Uh, John MacDonald, welcome. Can I ask you, first of all, about the story we've been talking about so far on the programme a lot, the, the poisoning attack in Salisbury. Um, there is a suggestion in today's papers that the so-called Magnitsky Act, which really cracks down on Russian money coming yeah. into this country, removes visas and so on, should be applied in Britain too. Do you agree with that? Yes, uh, we, the Labour Party moved amendments to the money laundering bill only a week ago uh, to introduce the Magnitsky Clause. At that stage, the Conservative Party opposed our amendments. We hope now that they'll enable us to bring those amendments back at report stage of the bill so that we can have effective action. Because what Ma Magnitsky does, it identifies those, and those individuals who are a basically found guilty of human rights abuses in particular. It prevents them then operating or having bank accounts in our country and it effectively closes down all cooperation with mm. them. Now, I think that could be remarkably effective. It was introduced several years ago by the Obama administration. We put amendments up, as I say, over a week ago. I don't know why the Conservatives opposed them. They said there were some yeah. technical issues. In fact, there was a bit of panic among Conservative ranks on the committee. Okay. Let's now work together on this and let's use this effective legislation. If this does prove to be a Russian attack, and I have to keep saying if because we don't know yet, but if it does, then clearly there needs to be a very strong British response. Um, Mrs Litvinenko was suggesting that after uh, the report into her husband's murder, the response simply wasn't strong enough. What would the Labour Party like to see if you were in power now? We've got to work, of course, let's see the outcome of the investigation. You're quite right, we can't leap to any conclusions at the moment. But it doesn't matter whichever state it is, we've got to use every diplomatic method we can, linked up with our European and other global allies, to ensure that we isolate that particular administration, if yeah. it is a state that's involved in this. It may well be um, a criminal operation, we don't know at the moment, but if it is a state, we cannot tolerate another state putting at risk people, our own citizens or people living in this country. So we've got to isolate them. And as I say, one of the method, I think one of the methods we can do that, even if it's not the state and it's around an individual, is the sort of measures like the Magnitsky clauses that okay. we were putting forward. One very clear thing that you could do is stop appearing on Russia Today, which has been described by one of your own ministers yeah. as a Kremlin propaganda vehicle. I think that's right now, and that's what I'll, I'll be doing. I've appeared on it in the past, sometimes to challenge some of the issues internationally mm -hmm. and also to raise issues here um, that we're concerned about in terms of, well, not just Russia's role, but also the international scene overall. And I think that's right, because I think from what we're seeing from Russian today at times, goes beyond objective journalism from what I've seen. So, yes, I think that's right. So you're, this is a change in, in direction. Peter O'Dowd, your deputy, was on Russia Today only yesterday. Are you going to be encouraging the rest of your colleagues to follow that lead? Yes, I am, because I'm, I've been looking overnight at some of the what's happening in terms of changes in coverage on Russian television in particular, and I think we have to step back now. And I can understand why people have up until now, because we've treated it like mm. every other um, television station. We've tried to be fair and making sure that, again, any country's television station, we try to be fair with mm. them. And as long as they abide by journalistic standards, which are objective, that's fine. But it looks as though they've be gone beyond because that line. So, yes, we'll be, we'll be having that discussion. I mean, with respect, it was never really like any other television station, was it? Tom Watson, the deputy leader, said... Uh, that Russia today was reporting false or inaccurate stories and aligned its editorial policy to that of President Putin's Russian state. And that was back in November. Well, at times there's been examples of that and I think now we need to take those into account, especially in this current climate, and that's what we'll do. Let me turn to the economic story of the day, I suppose, which is that rare thing, a cheerful Philip Hammond statement in The Sun today, when he says he talks about uh, wages going up by nearly 3%, he talks about paying off the day-to-day -day debt, finally uh, suggests the end of austerity, the sunlit uplands are ahead, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Now, putting aside the politics, can you at least give two cheers for what appears to be a change in the economic story in this country? No, because I don't think it's accurate. Last year, we had the lowest economic growth in the G7 countries, so we shouldn't be celebrating that. Austerity, this isn't me saying it, the head of the OBR has said it, the austerity is holding growth back. And wages now, wages are below 
what they were in 2000, 2007, 2008, below the banking crisis. So this isn't a matter of celebration. And you know, in terms of the deficit, we were promised by the Conservatives that they would wipe the deficit out completely three years ago. But I think it's not. I think what he's done, very cleverly, to be honest, very cunningly, he's shifted the deficit onto the shoulders of NHS managers, onto the shoulders of yeah. head teachers, and onto the shoulders of local government leaders. And his own local, local government leaders, Conservative council leaders now, are saying, uh, I quote the, his own council leader in Surrey, that they're facing a financial crisis because the government cut back. So and this isn't a matter of celebration. I think, I think actually he should be coming into the real world because as the Resolution Foundation have said in their reports today, 11 million people now, not just the poorest, but those just about managing, are going to be hit next month by the cuts yes. in the support that they get to the benefit system. So this isn't a matter for celebration by any means. Nevertheless, pay has been rising at an annual rate of 2.9% over the past six months. We've had the two strongest growth uh, quarters of productivity growth and the current budget surplus uh, for the first time since 2002. Something is happening out there. Well, look, you say on pay... Inflation, it's, pay is simply, at the moment, just about matching inflation, that's all. And then, let's say that what else he promised, you know, that they would lift the pay cap. Look at what they're doing to health workers. They're offering them literally just a standstill wage increase, and then they're forcing them to give up a day's holiday pay. These are people who work long hours, dedicated staff, in a vocation. I think it's just okay. miserly, and I actually think... I think it's mean-spirited, and this is the sort of thing we should be condemning, not celebrating. Let me ask you about your own plans. You've said recently that your objectives are socialist, no surprise there. This means an irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth in favour of ordinary people. When you say irreversible, what do you mean by that? Because governments come in, they have policies, they're replaced, the policies are replaced and so on. What is irreversible about what you want to do? Well, let's take the example of the Attlee government. What they did, they won the argument about how we manage our economy, and they won it for a generation, about how we manage the economy in the interest of everybody, how we establish a, a welfare state so everyone is looked after and cared for, how we give everyone a free education, free NHS. They won the argument for a whole generation. I think we're winning the argument now, and I think by embedding those, well, the understanding okay. of how the economy could work for everybody, we'll be able to have irreversible change in this country. Um, just round the corner from you in my hometown, there's lots of fishing communities up and down the East Coast in both directions, um, traditional fishing communities. Um, can I ask you, you have your own version when it comes to Brexit of cherry picking in the sense that you want uh, uh, changes on state aid, and workers' rights and so forth. So you need to have a proper negotiation in turn with Brussels. Would you be prepared to see uh, continental-based fishing fleets coming into British waters as part of that negotiation? Look, we want to ensure that our fisher, our own fisher people, lead the discussions that we're having about our future fishing industry. And what they're saying to us is in any negotiations, you've got to ensure that our livelihoods are protected but also you've got to ensure that the stock, the stock of fish is protected. So when we go into the negotiations, they're the people we'll be listening to. Now, of course, you say when you go into the negotiations, isn't the truth that it's much likelier if you become Chancellor, that you become Chancellor after this deal is done? And in that context, can I ask you about the impact assessments you'll have seen this week? The government's produced lots of impact assessments about possible outcomes. Do you think they're broadly speaking accurate? I'm, I'm anxious. I'm anxious about some of those impact assessments because it does reflect, I think, the nature of the negotiations as they now are. It does reflect, I think, the, well, the inability of our current government to secure a decent negotiated settlement. And I think if you change the style of the negotiations, worked on the base, and I've said this to you before, Andrew, I think that if you change the tone of these negotiations so you recognise that we're negotiating on the base of mutual interest and mutual benefit, we can actually, well, we can protect our economy yeah. and we can protect jobs. That's so, what we'll do in those negotiations. So if these impact assessments are in any way accurate, this is quite bad news for any Chancellor of any stripe coming in. 
uh, Tony Blair, I don't normally quote Tony Blair to you, but I'm going to today, said it's going to be very extremely difficult, he said, for Labour to deliver on its promises if it puts itself in the same sort of position on Brexit. It will have find it has less money to deal with the country's problems and it'll going to be distracted by dealing with Brexit rather than the health service, jobs and living standards. He has got a point there. You are going to come in, possibly in a situation where you have a, a lot of trouble over, on your plate about Brexit and you, yet you want a huge change in economic direct. Well, I welcome Tony Blair's advice, obviously, but I, I'm saying this to you. Of course I know we could inherit a real mess as a result of, well, the way these, the government is negotiating with the EU. I understand that. They are making, well, I don't, you know, a horlicks mm. of it, I think someone on their own side described it as. I understand that. But I think, I think we can resolve those matters by ensuring that we have well, cooperation in those negotiations. We don't flounce about saying, though, no deal is better. Right. You know, no deal is better than any okay. about all this sort of stuff. Threatening to walk away from the table. We've got to negotiate in the interests of our country and bring our country back together again. From well, day to day, Andrew, yes, well, I do not know in this government who is negotiating on behalf because they keep falling out in cabinet all the time. Okay. Well, listen. We'll talk more about this, I'm sure. But for now, enjoy Dundee, and thank you very much indeed.